For many years now, Russ and Craig have had many wide-ranging conversations with folks from all over the gaming world. This is one of those conversations. D6G, the Lost Chapter. Welcome back to Dunkin' Donuts. We're here with Luke Retallick from World's End Radio. How you doing, Luke? I am awesome. What can I get Got you for a donut? What can I get you? Uh, ooh, now that you mention it, uh, why don't you hit me up with a, a Boston cream, ooh, nice. uh, tri- chocolate chunk, and I'll have a vanilla bean culotta as ooh, well. Very well, well. Very There's well. a man who knows his Dunkin' Donuts menu. There you go. All right. Well, get right on, get right on that. Um, so, Craig, how are you doing tonight? Uh, I'm good. I actually snuck in a, uh, uh, a Frappuccino. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, well, don't let the man Just behind the counter see the guy it. on the counter. Right. You put it in this, in this warm cup, and it'll look like a Dunkin' Donuts cup. Yeah, that's um, not a big deal. So uh, Luke uh, was kind enough to come on and join us today, and had, his, had this idea. Uh, why don't we talk about, we've never done a lost chapter, really, on uh, building your gaming community. Mm. And I thought it's a great topic, because um, A, Craig and I have had some experience doing this, and of course, Luke has tons of experience doing this. Um, and we get this, this email quite a bit, actually, you know, how do you start a gaming group? How do you get your... How do you get to the point where you have this regular group of people that you can play with every one night a week or one night a month or how often you do it and get it started? Um, and I guess the, the, maybe the place to begin the discussion here is why, why bother building a community? Why not just you know, keep playing with your, you know, with your, with your friends at, in your basement or in your, on your kitchen table? Um, what's the point of building a community, Luke? Well, I was just about to say because playing with yourself is no fun, but then I caught myself. <laughs> and, and then you didn't <laughs> anyway. Play playing. I think games on your own is probably what I meant. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> is no fun at all. So you, you really do need to have a, a regular stream of people that you can, you know, have as opponents and, and interact with and have that kind of, you know, social engagement thing happening with. And the, the bigger the better. You want to have a lot of people who you can do that with because, you know, a, a community that uh, is, is growing and, and, you know, constantly thriving and changing and new blood coming all, in all the time really makes games exciting. And I think it can make the difference between, um, particularly on a, an international scale, the, the war games or, or board games that do very, very well and the ones that maybe don't do so well. Right. Exactly. And I think the, um, you know, Craig and I kind of started down this path when we got into miniature gaming. Yeah. Uh, in particular, because, you know, you can only, miniature games are expensive. You can only afford so many armies, and yet you want to be able to face and fight all these different armies that are in the game. And, and for really for that to work, you need to have lots of people. So the chance of having all these different armies running around is there. Um, so that was sort of the driving force. But, e- but even later with board games, it's great because you, um, you get a bigger draw of people who like different kinds of games. And all of a sudden, someone's bringing in a game you never thought you'd try and is asking, hey, you want to play this game with me? And all of a sudden, you're trying games that you wouldn't, you wouldn't normally maybe try or, or getting exposed to games now. You know, maybe you can't afford to buy Rune Wars and Descent you know, and Leviathans or whatever, because they're all $100 games. Well, if you've got one and your other friend's got one, now you can shift around and try different games and stuff. So having that bigger group of people gives you that option to play those games and get some of the games to the table that are higher player counts too. You know, five and six player games. It's kind of funny. Craig and I now are in a situation where we need those higher player count games because otherwise we feel like we're leaving people out. But we get lots of emails from folks saying, you know, I, I... you know, I, I need a three or four player game. I, I, you know, I never can get more than that many people to the to the table, or, or more than two or three people to the table. So, um, and that's how you do that. How you get there is you got to build these communities. So, um, it's quite a tragedy, really, when you think about how many great games out there potentially go unplayed and unexperienced by so many people because they just can't find enough people to actually play with. Right. You know? And it, it's amazing how you, you talk to. People. I mean, we, we get a lot of this too because people always, you know, contact us and say, you know, you guys are in a really, really remote location out there. You know, we are located at the end of the world, you know, literally. <laughs> and they say, how how do you actually find players for this system or that system? You know, it, it's so hard to get people in my local area to actually play this game, and that's why I haven't experienced it. Right. And uh, yeah, I think what people don't realize is that you don't always have to to be passive and accept that. You you can often take the initiative and go out and build your own community, and, right. and then get to experience that game if you actually know what to do. Exactly right. So I guess. Uh, the question would be: How do they start? What, what do you? What did you guys do to um, to go from you know maybe you and your best friend and a couple of people uh, to having a? How did you get? To, what were the first steps you guys took? Okay, well you're gonna have to bear with me. I'm gonna sort of take you on a, a little tale with this one because I think Ooh. you have to understand the larger context okay. in terms of, of Western Australia and how the scene out here actually works. So, I mean, I've been involved in community building out here for a long, long time now. Um, 
basically back from my early days of working for Games Workshop, um, mm -hmm. you know, which I started around 1998, so a long, long time ago now. Right. Um, right. And when, when I actually started working for the company, we, we basically were opening up a shop in Perth, Western Australia, which was the first um, sort of Games Workshop retail store out here. And a, a big part of the task that we had ahead of ourselves was not only – you know, opening up, opening up a store and starting to establish a retail presence, but it was also about, you know, building that, that Games Workshop sort of tabletop community as well. And um, it was tough. It was really hard going. It wasn't just about operating a store. It was about basically doing all the stuff that we're going to be talking about so that you can actually, you know, build that base for later expansion so you can actually open up more stores down the track. Mm -hmm. And whilst I was sort of doing it partly as my job, it became a real passion of mine and, and something I've been involved in, you know, since that time. And it's it's gone into a much wider format now, where we're no longer just talking about you know the Games Workshop community; it's the gaming community and WA in general. So, there's a few milestones that I could probably pick out along the way that are really the tips that we want to give people listening to this episode today. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that you, you can almost bring it down to three key points in my mind. One is that you've got to actually be able to locate people with mm -hmm. a common interest. And locating them is not as simple as it sounds sometimes. Uh, the second one is that you need to establish a, a means of communication or interaction. Mm -hmm. So you, you've got to work out how you're going to do that. And that can often be you know, meeting places or, or you know, online forums and that sort of thing. Um, but the third thing, and this is probably the most important one for long-term sustainability, is that you've actually got to build a consistent and sustainable model for activity. And mm -hmm. that is sort of seen in a lot of places with you know, the different tournament scene formats that you have, your mm -hmm. event calendars, you know, conventions that pop pop up that happen at the same time every year and all that stuff too. So, you know, I, I think big picture about this kind of thing. It's not just about a, a single gaming group or a games club for me. I, I really look at it in terms of how our entire state has developed over the last decade or so. Oh, cool. Yeah, I think um, we did something similar. I think um, when we uh, started back in 95, it was really when we started trying to get our group going. Um, you know, it was it sort of was the early days of the internet and everything. So we were looking more at, um, you know, hanging flyers in stores and just trying to, because I'm with you, it's, it's how do you, when you want to begin, when you want to find more than three people, you know, um, you got to have a place to meet, you got to have a way to communicate, um, and, and I think you got to get that core to get rolling, right? So what we did was we found a local gaming store, and there were like four of us, uh, Craig, myself, and a couple of, and my brother and another friend, and we just started going there and play, playing regularly. So there'd be only four of us there playing, but we just play, and we would go the same day every week and play and then we'd hang a little sign up that said hey you want to play on our necromunda it was necromunda want to play our necromunda league did we hang up We're signs here. we did we had, well eventually we had signs hanging up in the, in the wizard's tower yeah oh and, that's right we did and because remember before the website so we had like the league stats hanging up there yeah yeah, yeah. oh that's right like, i did posters wanna, using right. photoshop remember you did all the posters and you got and, did. And, and so people started coming uh just to because it was like great i can play in this thing and all i gotta do is buy this one little war band and that was how we started it, and then um, it went from there. So, but but the the key, I think, what got the ball rolling was the fact that there were always going to be this group of people there on the same day, every yeah. day, even if it was only four people or three people. If you're there all the time, then one more person will come and jump in, and then yeah. after a couple of weeks, another person will come, and after a month, one more, and then it starts growing exponentially because they tell two friends, and all of a sudden, before you know it, you got twenty people and you're dividing into divisions and all this stuff because. It didn't take that long. So it's really, that's the, I think that's the key. It's consistency and location and a little bit of communication in the beginning. And then as you get bigger, there's other challenges we'll get to. But that's sort of how we started rolling. I think one of the challenges too when you're talking about actually building a group with a common interest is almost, I guess, laying the foundation as to what that common interest is. Mm -hmm. Because there's no good sort of building a, a gaming community or you know any sort of community where people have different expectations as to why they're meeting and what they're actually mm -hmm. doing. So if, if you have, say, for example, someone who's a huge game of uh, a huge fan of collectible card games, and then you have someone who's a huge fan of role playing games, and you're trying to build a group um, with those two players in mind. You know, if, if one comes to meetings that you set up expecting to play cards and one comes expecting to play role play, mm -hmm. uh, then, you know, you might have an issue there. So having that expectation set with what that common interest is and sometimes even limiting it can be, you know, advantageous so that you, you know, you're almost focusing your efforts on making sure that everybody, you know, gets to, to do what they want to do. Yeah, we actually ran into that problem recently ourselves because we had built this group over years and years and years of focused on one thing, which was, you know, games, workshop games. And for many years, it was the same thing. So everybody was on the same yeah. focus. They came in knowing everybody's going to play the same thing. But over the past, like, I don't know, four or five years, it's all broken up into everybody plays all kinds of stuff. We got miniature gamers. It's we got closer to 10 board gamers, whatever it is. Um, 
What's this deck? Well, yeah, I guess it's been dead now. Yeah, it's, um, it's, so, time flies, my friend. So, it's so almost <laughs> caught us. So as it, so as that split up, what started happening was we had some, we had some challenges in the group because people were coming for different expectations. They wanted more space. They wanted less space. They didn't want RPGs being played there. They didn't want RPGs being played there. So it was like this whole that became a challenge. So I think you're right. If you can focus, the more you can focus what your group's playing, the um, the easier time you're going to get. Um, now, of course, you're going to be a slightly smaller group, but that's probably a good thing, right? Because if you have, everybody's focused on the same thing, you're, you're going to do, you're going to have a better uh, expectation, right? That's right. One of the most successful gaming clubs that we have out here in Western Australia is a club by the name of Outpost 6030. And uh, they started up in the early sort of 2000s. And one of the things that actually gave them their great strength when they were growing and developing was that they were focused exclusively on Games Workshop games. Mm -hmm. You know, they actually had it written into their club's constitution that you may not play other games at the club. It has to be a Games Workshop game. Mm -hmm. Um, And that that was great in some aspects, uh, you know, particularly back then where, you know, there was a huge um, scene that was very Games Workshop driven and a lot of the other competitors out there that are there these days didn't so much exist back then Mm -hmm. um, because you could turn up to this club at any given night Mm -hmm. and without any prior engagement whatsoever, you could almost be guaranteed that there was going to be somebody there with an army ready to play you. You didn't actually need to even organize it beforehand. Um, Nowadays, they've actually diversified a bit and they play all sorts of different tabletop war games. Still a very, very good club. But the difference is that whilst there's a lot more, uh, I guess, flexibility in what you can play there, you can't anymore turn up on an average club night and just Mm -hmm. expect to get a game at the drop of a hat without actually organizing it beforehand. Yeah. So... Yeah, spe- specialization is a, a great strength, particularly when you're starting out. You don't have to stay that way forever, but mm-hmm. I, I think it's worth considering. Yeah, definitely in the beginning. Right. Well, it's also know. probably going to be almost um, organic that way because you're coming together with, as you say, one specific passion that's bringing you together. And it might be gaming, but it quite often is going to be one particular game that you really want to play, like when we were doing Necromunda and then it grew in other games like that. Mm. Right. Sort of happens on its own in many cases, I would imagine. That's right. Well, as you get to know the people, the the thing that brings you together is no longer just the game. It's actually that you know that relationship that you've got with the other players. You become right. And that, friends. Yeah. yeah, and that's what happens. And, and then you get, you, you'll actually instead of going and meeting them with no game. Yeah. Well, that's right, and that's and that's when it gets interesting because then you uh, you get the interesting situations like we've had where you want to be with the people you've built relationships with, but now all of a sudden. Half the group, you know, not half, but certain people want to play certain games. They want to play other games, and now you got this sort of pull and push going on, which sort of gets interesting as you go forward. So uh, that is kind of interesting. Um, how did you guys move to? Um, uh, let's talk about communication for a bit, because I think that's really key. I, I think you know you mentioned that as as the clubs got bigger, they had to you had to schedule some games. Um, we have the same thing now, where you don't know if it's going to be you know. Uh, there's always miniature games being played, but you don't know if the if the game this week is Malifo or is it you know Dust or is it uh, 40k or is it war machine what's being played this week at the store uh, or wherever you gather so communication is really important um what do you got what have you guys used over the years luke to kind of keep everybody in touch with what's going on and and, and the latest uh the latest tournament scene and all that stuff well i'm going to sound a little biased here because one of the the best methods that we've got of communication in our gaming community is actually something that i created so i'm gonna i'm gonna sound a little bit sort of like i'm uh, ruffling my feathers here oh but, man you know. crow like a rooster baby <laughs> you built it you earned it <laughs> That's it. Well, I mean, back in the early days, um, sort of linking back to this uh, Games Club Outpost 6030 again, um, what one of the, the primary means of communications were was like the old Yahoo uh, sort of mailing group, mm-hmm. mailing list um, set up that used to be used a fair bit. Mm-hmm. So it, it was basically you, you would send emails to this mailing list and it would get cascaded out to all of the other people right. who had signed up to this yep. list. Mail group. Now, that that was good for a while and, and you know, in the early days of, of the internet um, before, you know, uh, online sort of uh, bulletin board forums had become the norm and Facebook hadn't sort of taken off in the way that it has now, uh, that, that was really, really useful. But over time, it became, uh, I guess, unsustainable because there was no way to basically carry on a consistent conversation that someone could go back to at a later date. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you sort of had to dig buck through your emails and you, you couldn't kind of... I guess contribute to something that had you know long, long since gone as a topic. Right. So um, around this time, it was uh, around the time where I was actually considering um, you know my career with Games Workshop and how much longer I was going to to sort of stick around. And I had a lot of engagement with the community that was uh, sort of largely driven through my role with the company. And I, I decided that I, the state not only needed a better way for gamers to communicate, but I also wanted to create a bit of a legacy that would carry on after I left employment with the company. Mm-hmm. So it was a bit of an exit strategy for me in a way. <laughs> and um, so I created a uh, an online forum called West Gamer. 
Yep. Now, West Gamer has um, sort of been around for about five years now. Um, we're entering into our sixth year now, and it's become much, much bigger than just a, a gaming forum because we've, we've sort of gone down the route of, uh, you know, organizing events. And, and you know, we, we run a fairly high-profile tournament over here every year as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's no longer just myself. There's, there's a team of people that actually work on it. But um, West Gamer, you know, sort of started out as basically just a, an internet forum for Western Australian gamers and only Western Australian gamers to communicate about tabletop wargaming, you know, specifically Games Workshop Gaming, but as time went on, you know, other games too. But the the forum really became massive and so much so that I think it, I would be surprised in a lot of cases now if uh, someone goes to a games club in, in Western Australia and hasn't at least heard of or created an account on the forum to interact with other players that are going to different mm-hmm. clubs in the community. Um, I, I do get surprised every now and then when, when someone sort of says to me, you know, oh, I only just found out about this. I'm like, yeah. wow. You really missed out. <laughs> but, you know, we, we've got uh, a little under a thousand actual real um, sort of members on the site now. Not all of them are active, but a, a vast majority of them are. Um, and it, it has contributed a huge deal to how active and vibrant our gaming community is because it's really brought everybody together to a central location. That's fantastic. Um, yeah. So it's, it's helped a lot. Well, that's awesome. And I think that and forums are a great way uh, to do that. In fact, we did something very similar, right? Um, <laughs> it, uh, you actually, may have heard of it. Very similar. Uh, we started putting, um, so in the beginning also, we started putting up, um, I just created a form. I, put, I actually created a website in front page from Microsoft front page and put a little thing. This is like 95 or what it was. And I put, we just put up our um, a, a little form to talk. And it was public because it was easy. And we started putting pictures of our armies up there. And um, that's. And I just thought it'd be funny to name it Daka Daka. And that's what eventually became DakaDaka.com. Which is which is sort of similar. It sounds like to what you built. Um, Daka Daka now got what kind of got crazy about Daka Daka was it built beyond the scope of just a little cl- group of guys in New England who played games. It became this sort of international community, um, and it's much bigger than me now. I'm not even involved with it anymore. Um, you know, John Regul does a great job over there, and Lego Burner they do a great job running that thing. Um, but it's sort of cool to see, and it's sort of neat to see how, and it shows the power of of why you build a community. I mean, you know you get this legacy now of like, there's this really cool thing that goes on because basically a group of four guys decided to play Necromunda. And now there's this, this international community of people comparing, right. you know, G games, workshop games and other games now too. Yeah. Um, and another great story like that is Adepticon. Adepticon mm. is a group of guys who got together, started playing and thought, wouldn't it be funny to start a tournament a little bigger. And all of a sudden, before you know it, and it went a lot of work and elbow grease, they have one of the best gaming scenes, not only in the United States, but but in the world in terms of, of uh, Games Workshop tournaments. And actually, now it's all kinds of different miniature gaming tournaments yeah. uh, for them. So you can really, you know, if you, really the sky's the limit with stuff, with this stuff, once you get the ball rolling and sort of figure out effective ways to communicate. And I think nowadays there's even easier ways to communicate. And we still use our local group, actually. Um, our, ver- our very tight local group uses uh, our own little email list still. Um, but you know, a lot of people now use you know social media, Facebook and Twitter or whatever to keep synced up as well. So there's lots of ways to stay in touch, and it's easier than ever and more affordable than ever, really. Because when we started, it was like, hey, go to this website. What's a website? You know, people still the average person on the street in the mid '90s they knew what the internet was, but not everybody you know knew how to get there, had an email address even then. So now it's much easier to communicate. It's much it's much easier to get that group going, and there's really it's very very simple now to stay in touch. I think one of the things that we've found over time as well, which is an interesting site effect of the the whole sort of forum based community or online social media community it, it's almost similar to how you you pick a uh, a very diverse range of interests for your group or you pick a, a specific thing to target the, the same thing can be true as to how you build your your community um, sort of interaction as well if it, like with West Gamer, we've made it exclusively for Western Australia I mean mm-hmm. other people from around the world can join the forum and, and sort of communicate right. but the reason why it's uh, desirable for people who are in Perth or, or Western Australia to actually be on there is because they're talking to guys who are local mm-hmm. and they actually you know are, are theoretically going to run into these people at some point point. If you join a community that's much broader and uh, spread over a much larger distance, and I think Daka Daka is probably a good example of this, you know, you're going to have those sort of groups within groups that form, mm-hmm. but the, the community as a whole is maybe not as unified. Right. Now, we've got another really large uh, Australian wargaming forum called Wargamer AU, which um, is w- basically, uh, it's almost like all of East Coast, it, it's sort of turned mm-hmm. into where they come on and they interact in a similar sort of way to what we do. One of the biggest benefits of West Gamer is also one of its biggest hindrances because for a long time, we've almost been cut off from the rest of the country in terms of how we interact and the general visibility of the wargaming scene over here because everybody in WA is on our forum and everybody who's not in WA is on Wargamer AU. 
So our biggest strength has also kind of cut us off in a way. And it's only through other things in more recent years that we've really established a presence on the national scene um, as opposed to just our state scene to sort of remind people that, hey, we're over here and doing a lot of fun stuff. So right. you, you kind of have to, to think about you know, your, your crowd. It can be um, you know, really uh, insular or it can be hugely expansive and, and maybe not quite as engaging. So it's a, it, it, finding the balance is kind of tricky sometimes. Right. Uh, that's a good point. I think, and that is that is uh, that is an interesting challenge, and it is tough. And that's one of the reasons we actually, um, I still, you know, there's always going to be a special place in my heart for DACA and DACA, but we don't really organize our local stuff on DACA. We we have obviously have our own methods for that um, because of the same thing. You need to have that. You definitely want a smaller sort of, um, hey, chatting here is just the local group kind of thing, so you get that more personal feel, right? Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Let's talk about what happens when you start to grow, right? So so let's say you've got your group and you've grown it. You know, you got your three or four guys, and all of a sudden you're ten, or, and you get near fifteen or something. And and you know, you'd mentioned Luke, like maybe you want in the charter that you only play games, workshop games, or maybe you want in the rules. You know, so now we've just discussed, we've just hinted at this idea that there's a set of rules someplace about this club, and you know, there's someone making decisions. And and how do you go from, you know, a few guys sitting around to okay, wait, here's the rules, here's you're in or you're out, you get to be in. How did you guys sort of transition to that point, or who kind of? grab the reins and sort of de started defining things. I think one of the tricks is is almost not having some one person who grabs the reins and this is a, a lesson that I'm constantly learning. Right. <laughs> one, one that I have have uh, learned the hard way many many times and I'm still learning. So you know you just like to <laughs> like to be involved and you like to I'm not a control freak or anything. But <laughs> I think one of the keys to long-term sustainable growth is that you can't have the same people doing everything. Right. So you actually have to have more than just a, a couple of key individuals that you know maybe have initially started the whole thing and, and kicked off the whole shebang. They can't be the ones that are driving it forevermore mm -hmm. because it, even in the short term, if you set that expectation, then everybody else who's a part of that group will come on fully expecting to be a passenger and not actually have to do anything to right. contribute at that level. Whereas if you get them involved at an early, early sort of stage and you know, get people actually helping to promote the club and, you know, building resources that you might need and, you know, driving discussion rather than just contributing to it and all that sort of stuff, then you're much more likely to build a long-term sustainable model for, you know, the club's success even when you don't happen to be around to actually ensure that it continues. So when you're talking about rules and, and sort of setups for any sort of community group and if we're talking about an actual club in the traditional sense, you might actually have your appointed roles of a committee where you, you have like a club president or a, a vice president, a treasurer, a secretary and those sorts of set roles. You, you may, may want to make sure that those roles are very flexible um, in that they can delegate things to other people or, or get others involved in what they're doing or even better still make sure that the same people don't inhabit those roles for too long like share it around make sure that you get right. lots of people actually contributing at the the higher level because uh, there's nothing worse than sort of being stuck in the position where you're running a club and not actually playing games because <laughs> then it becomes all you know it, it's almost like a second job <laughs> right, right yes yeah exactly wanna... uh, that's a great point i think um yeah, that's something I think we've been down that path before, and and uh, I remember particularly when we started the. Um, I was going to say sometimes you might start a, uh, start a business, and it is a job, right? Mm. Um, we had the well, we went the uh, when we first did the forty k league. Um, one of the biggest challenges that I ran into, especially forty k back then, uh, you know, is the is the forty k rules are um, or were and, and still are in some ways fluid, right? There's some there's some areas like gray areas you got to clear up. So we thought, wouldn't it be great if we? Um, and this is back again in the nineties. Uh, in early 2000s when there was, you know, you're lucky to get a fact once every three years. So we're kind of like, well, we got to work this out because to make it playable. And we needed, we had to make up more missions and things like that. And so we started this group of uh, arbiters. We had three guys who are the arbiters. And I don't even remember how we voted them in. It just sort of happened. Um, and then they would hold a sort of a pre-league meeting and they'd go through and they'd, they'd get everybody together and sort of say, um, here are the, anyone who want to make any suggestions for the league or anything else. And they would kind of make the final decision. And that was it. Um, and it worked fine, and everybody sort of, you know, accepted it. It was okay, but um, it did become, as you're suggesting, all of a sudden, there's this constant um, workload on these guys all the time. There's the constant pressure of doing it and keeping track of the score and running the events and, and keeping the rules up to date, and it's just a constant, constant drain um, um, on them. So I think you definitely want to rotate those roles and figure out ways you can keep them moving around and, and uh and minimize them to the point where I got so burnt out and I don't want to have any leadership ability ever again in the group. <laughs> Pretty much, I just like I have to get all responsibility. But um, but yeah, I think that's a good. I think your your points about well made there, Luke, about the idea of uh, of keeping everybody keeping like they're doing a little bit of work. You know, 
Absolutely. I mean, I'm a huge motivator in terms of life in general that, uh, sorry, motivator. I'm a believer rather that you can't actually motivate people. I think the mm-hmm. best way to go is to actually create an environment in which they can motivate themselves. So if you create an environment where they feel like uh, contributing uh, and innovating and, and sort of, you know, putting their hand up to do things is non-threatening and encouraged and, and actually quite a rewarding experience, then people will do it. You know, you don't actually need to push them to do something which is great. But I think to a certain extent, it's also about influencing others. And, you know, my, my little trick with influence is that you kind of need to have two key things to be able to, to influence people to actually, you know, do a particular thing. On one hand, you need to have the authority of some sort of, you know, degree. And that authority can be that you're recognized as an authority on a particular topic and people sort of respect you because you're a, you know, an experienced gamer or you've, you know, done a lot of community work and, and people know that you know what you're about. Um, and on the other side, uh, you really need to build respect because people are never going to listen to what you have to say or you know, actually take heed of advice that you give them if they don't respect you. But one, one interesting thing that's happened in recent years is that we now have representatives um, from various different games companies that almost are, are sort of you know, charged with the task of influencing local communities to you know, aid in their community building. Mm-hmm. And they need to really effectively leverage that kind of authority and respect combination to, to get things happening. And I'm talking about like your, your weird miniatures henchmen, mm-hmm. your private press press gangers, um, even back in the old days when Games Workshop ran the Outrider, Outrider program. Right. You know, that's these people that were involved and incentivized um, by these companies by, you know, getting uh, sometimes some goods that they could actually uh, use themselves like uh, free models and things like that. Um, But a lot of the drive for them is, you know, just getting that community engagement, but they do it in in a really challenging way in which they've actually got a label um, that they are almost representing a particular company. So you you can have people like that who are always going to do the work because they've kind of been appointed to those roles. But I, I don't think you can rely on them either. They, they're there to assist, but they don't want to be driving the whole thing themselves. That's a bit of a danger like we were talking about. Oh, yeah. We see that before in our area too. Like you'll get a really good person like that in your area and they can run, you know, you get a really great um, game scene going on with that particular game. Yeah. Uh, but then if that particular person leaves or decides, you know, or moves or, or gets burnt out, or gets burnt out, right, all of a sudden that whole game will just collapse, right? Because yeah. it's a lot with tournament organizers especially, yeah. I find. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and well, the th- sad thing is that knowing that that might happen will push a person to go beyond the point of burnout and then cause severe burnout right? <laughs> where they probably will stop gaming altogether. And we've had that happen with several people. Yep. And the other thing that can happen too is, and the same thing happens with stores, right? You'll have stores that are essentially game centers around a community. Uh, and if that store changes ownership or goes under or whatever, or moves, uh, that'll, you'll have, you know, you'll lose that whole community as well. So it's tough to, um, to do that. In fact, we went a route, um, and I want to ask about this, Luke, too. Um, we went around for a brief period of time uh, after our, our main stores left was to go to, like, we rented a private hall. And we're like a private club, um, if you will. Do you guys try, do you find that it's more effective? I mean, what do you think about the whole public versus private thing? We have um, some historical clubs up here in this area that are very, very private. And, like, to even go to their event, you have to be invited by someone else. And then you get in and you... Um, and then you can play the games with them. And I've been invited to that one. A couple of those. There's actually some very, very, uh, like, you know, there's a Napoleonic club that does it and some other uh, DB2s or whatever they are. Um, and uh, it looks interesting, but at the same time, like, it's too, I don't know, it's very intense to me. So I don't know, it puts me off a little bit. But what do you guys think about the, the whole the public versus private approach to clubs? One of the biggest drivers for private sort of gaming groups that I tend to find are those who want to associate with people of a similar uh, age group. Right. And, yeah. um, you often have, uh, you know, some some of your more gentlemanly clubs, uh, the ones that uh, are perhaps a little bit uh, longer in the tooth, as we like to say, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, who like to, you know, play with adults and, and not necessarily have kids running under foot. And by kids, I mean anyone they consider uh, under, you know, 25. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they might consider it to be a, a bit young in that respect. Um, there's, there's another club out in our area called the Napoleonic Wargaming Society, mm-hmm. um, which has often been um, sort of known out here as kind of like the experienced gamers club, the, the gentlemanly club, which has a lot of the, the sort of mature aged uh, historical wargamers. Mm-hmm. And they've undergone a really interesting uh, sort of dynamic shift recently where they've basically been invaded by War Machine and Hordes players. <laughs> and uh, it, it's hilarious and the reason why it's happened is because they have great facilities they're set up at a licensed venue um you know they meet on a night of the week that is is very easy for a lot of people to to get to which is a wednesday night and uh it it sort of started off with a couple of people uh you know going along and then it steamrolled and uh what I think a, a lot of the the old um, I'm going to call them old timers, but it's a really unfair label because they're not old or anything. It's more right. sort of in terms of their experience with the group. 
Um, what a lot of the old timers have sort of come to realize, I think, is that that injection of new life into that group has actually been a really positive thing for them, even though they, they didn't necessarily realize that they, they may have wanted it in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, some of them will always be put off by it and, and they may choose to, you know, take their interests elsewhere and form another group. But at the end of the day, a, a club that doesn't grow and change and accept new members can stagnate a little bit. And I mm-hmm. think that's a bad thing. So the, the clubs that are, are private, um, more often than not, I think that they tend to be like that because maybe they haven't been shown some of the benefits they can get from being a bit more public and a bit more visible and uh, mm. open to, to other people getting involved. But that being said, a, a lot of uh, groups out there are private um, by nature. I mean, probably the vast majority of Wargamers out there, um, s- still surprisingly, are the, the small groups of friends that meet in like a basement or a garage right, to actually right. play games. They've never or been in England. Game. It's in England. It's the vast majority, I believe. Absolutely, you Meaning can't underestimate church halls and things like that. Yeah. A lot of people who post online, particularly on uh, on forums, tend to forget that there is a huge number of gamers out there. Probably that you know, even outnumber them in a lot of areas that don't even post on on you know public websites and, right. and don't yeah. interact at game stores or clubs or events. But they're there and they matter. And you know, they may be insular, but they still make up a large population of the gamers. So. You know, it's it's kind of crazy to think about. It's almost like an untapped resource in some respects. I find, right. and uh, getting getting engagement with them it can be a real challenge because uh, you know they're often very set in their ways. Well, let's talk about. I think that's a good segue into venue, right? Because a lot of people, um, you know, I'm 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 the kind of gamer. I like a lot of loud noise. I like a you know I like a party while I'm gaming, basically. So I don't I like playing in a store where it's raucous and people, you never know who's going to walk up and ask you about the game and all that kind of stuff. And it's just sort of the craziness. But a lot of people really prefer that, you know, that quiet venue where it's, you know, maybe you and a few guys and, and, and you just, you can concentrate and you can relax and there's not someone shouting enough to yell, to yell to be heard. Um, what do you find is sort of, what have you guys kind of come to the, as the ideal venue? Do you have a variety of venues? Do you guys kind of focus on one particular location or, or how do you, how important is venue to be able to grow your group? I don't know about you guys, but I tend to prefer different venues depending on what I'm playing. So if I'm playing a board game um, or a card game, I actually prefer a more intimate setting where I might be playing at someone's kitchen table or at uh, you know at a small store where you're not going to get bothered by people. Mm-hmm. But when I'm playing a, a large sort of tabletop war game where I've actually you know made the effort to paint my models and get them looking really excellent, and I almost want to show that off at the same time as playing, right. I love playing big clubs and big tournaments and and things like that where you can draw an audience. And actually getting a crowd watching your table can be quite thrilling sometimes. It so, is, yeah. yeah. That's, that's the best part of miniature gaming, I think, is actually having people come up and actually uh, yeah. look closely at your models and, and you know and ask to see them. It's kind of funny. People sometimes are, like, concerned they don't want to touch your models, and, and you shouldn't touch those models without asking. But at the same time, if for have, so someone wants to look at your stuff there's, really closely. There's a future TLC. Right? Uh, <laughs> never <laughs> touch a man's never, models. Never touch another man's models. Um, but at the same time, it really, um, you appreciate being appreciated right that's part of the of the game oh, and heck yeah and it's awesome also and that's one of the reasons i think i really like playing in a store because people come up and they don't even know what this game existed and all of a sudden they're looking at these are really amazing you painted these what they can even paint you know so that's i think that's a lot of that that part's a lot of fun and um and i, I agree with you luke i mean right it depends on uh where you play obviously it's going to going to dictate the kind of experience you have and i think me personally i I'm, I'm i think craig and i are in the same place on role-playing games i like to play role-playing games in more of a private setting Oh, yeah. I, just I, think it, I, I no longer to, will even try to play a role-playing game in, in a store. public setting. But, but at the same time, I think that if you're trying to grow a group, um, I think you've got a much better chance of your group getting a few members here and there by playing in a public location, especially in this location where where the majority of people, the traffic is would be interested in that game, right? So um, if you have the opportunity to play in a game store, that's a great place to pick up new people. If you're looking to grow your group organically, if, again, you're those five or six people and you're just looking to have more people in your group, um, that's a great way to do it. If you're playing in a public venue like a, some libraries let you play or, or uh, bookstores let you play, that works also, but you're less likely to have, you know, the traffic there is not at 100% gamers, right? So if you can get to a store, I think it's great if you're really trying to grow your group. Once you've got your group established, um, then you can move the venues around, and we actually did that. We went to a private, you know, we were, in a, we were in actually in a, in a function room at a restaurant for a few years um, as a way to just have a, have a place to play. Uh, but definitely, we that that was when. But those years, we felt our group actually getting smaller and smaller and smaller and shrinking because we weren't getting the public expo- public exposure we used to get. But just playing in a in a place people could see us. 
That's right. I mean, at- atmosphere is a big part of social gaming, and I think that you know that kind of enthusiasm can be really infectious too. And you see it on a really large scale at conventions and mm. uh, you know large tournaments. I mean, who has ever been to a convention um, or a, I mean a, a huge forty uh, k tournament, for instance, where you've got the crowd literally you know out of nowhere just breaking into a huge whoa, and a hundred people will suddenly give voice and you know just shout out their war cry. And uh, it's just – it's fantastic to be part of. It really can, you know, really, uh, I guess, get you excited and get you more um, engaged with everybody there and create that great community feel. So, you know, the bigger the better for some things. But, you know, I, I agree with Craig. I definitely wouldn't like to play a role-playing game in that setting unless, uh, yeah. I, I guess, you were televising it for, for some right, sort yeah, of purpose. Yeah, yeah, if there's a reason. <laughs> you right, probably yeah. wouldn't want to do it unless – that's right. Yeah, right. Hard, hard to concentrate when you've got that much uh, buzz going on around you. Yeah, uh, well, I get this question a lot. We get this question about games too, in general. But um, over the years, Luca, running these these events and, and dealing with you know organizing the events and managing the events, and uh, how do you deal with like troublemakers, people who don't really have you had a lot of that, or has it not really been a problem for you? People who are just make it a little more challenging to be in the group for whatever reason, or or, or you, people get complaints about because this guy is consistently not playing up to club standards, whatever those are, meaning that you know he, he misreads the rules constantly or, or whatever the case may be, as politically correct as I can say it. Have you ever had those well, kind of problems? They generally get tied up and glued and flocked <laughs> where I come from. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Tower of Wood of Tower of Feather. No, no. Seriously. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. It's um, Thankfully, we've had very little of that to deal with. And... Uh, I mean, certainly not to the extent where we've had to worry about employing, you know, security um, for for different venues when we we run events. Oh, we, we've had the the odd sort of malcontent to deal with, but I think that if you've got the right kind of community, it it often sort of regulates and polices itself to a certain extent. So if someone uh, is you know demonstrating unacceptable behaviour, then it, it'll get pointed out by the group pretty rapidly, and you know they've really got no reason to be there if if no one wants them there and, and sort of you know stops uh, interacting with them. It becomes pretty clear that they're you know no longer wanted, and uh, unless they're I, I guess really pathological in the way that they they need personal contact, they're probably just going to do the right thing and, and no longer come themselves. But um, I, I don't know. We've never really had anything serious uh, break out, like a fist fight in the middle of a tournament or anything like that, because uh, we, we do sort of have those structures set up, particularly with competitive events where things might get taken a bit more seriously, where uh, players, in order to do well, actually need to mine their sportsmanship right. because it's a thing that's scored at a lot of events, and that, that kind of helps. But um, I don't know. I'd, I'd just like to think we've got a really good bunch out here, to, to be honest. And I'm kind of thankful we haven't had to deal with anything uh, too serious in the past. I'm not saying it won't happen ever in the future, but um, there was a really interesting case earlier last year, actually, over in the East Coast of Australia, where uh, there was a player who was actually caught out um, at an event using um, specially crafted loaded dice. Oh, wow. And, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a pretty serious matter, actually, because this guy um, had actually won several tournaments over in the East Coast um, using these dice. and. Oh. Uh, it um, was sort of revealed just before he was about to be selected for the state team for our Australasian team championship. Okay. And uh, it was really fortunate that it got dealt with before then because it would have been quite embarrassing for the state in question if, if that had been discovered, you know, after he'd been involved on the state team. But right. the, the efforts that they went to to actually catch this guy out and sort of expose him were, you know, it was, it was like an episode of CSI. It was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it was really funny. But um and and then this uh this same um person actually got caught out uh, a short time afterwards um uh, with uh, golden demon fraud as well so it was just a really <laughs> weird wow. situation yeah, yeah it gets pretty but extreme I'm happy to say it's the exception rather than the rule it just doesn't ha- tend to happen at all so well, that's, that's good yeah we've never had we, we never had anything even to that level um and never a fistfight or anything like that but we did have in the early days in particular we had a couple players who um. Just no one really. It was it was more of an awkward social thing, really, where it was just the way they played the game. Um, you know, the, the kind of person who's always taking the extra two inches when they move, and you know, always forgetting the rule and or mis uh, misremembering the rule that you know he should, you know that kind of thing. You know, right. you the can, same being corrected on the same rule right. over and exploit, over. Again. There's ways you can you know, it, especially in the earlier versions of 40k, it was very easy to exploit uh, certain elements of the game. Um, and so it just at a point where the person no one would play him anymore, and 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 he didn't really understand why. You know, it's one of those things where, you know, those sort of, those sort of things. And really, all you can really do is all we could figure out to do is take the person aside and just kind of explain, hey, you know, this is the perception, and you need to work on that sportsmanship concept to kind of, you know, we can't make anybody play you. So if you don't, you know, if they don't want to play you, they don't want to play you, kind of thing. And and it's a little awkward, but um, I think you have right. to kind of walk down that path to kind of get people clear on 
on what's yeah. going on. I, I think it's interesting because whenever you try to organize gamers past a certain sort of Brownian generic point, everybody starts worrying about, well, what are we going to do when that guy comes along and we have to get rid of him? Or how are we going to discipline that guy? But like you say, mm-hmm. it, it really doesn't happen. That, like, I mean, we had a couple guys that, you know, they're – Took a couple inches. There was, there's always, uh, there was that one guy who rolls all of his dice and then picks them up before any human could read them and says, "Yep, yep, I hit hit ten times or whatever," you know. Or uh, the guy that um, uses uh, way way back when uh, fielded an entire army with no arms, <laughs> which meant no weapons. And how, how, was it an army? paper? What's that? How was it an army then? Wouldn't it be a torso no. <laughs> Very good. Cool. Nicely done. Oh, someone's in the middle of their morning and nice and chipper and mentally on the on the ball. It sucks to be you. Because yeah, that certainly is not me right now. Um, nice. Oh, but this guy had little slips of paper in front of each model saying what they were carried. And, of course, those slips would shift from turn to turn. And the, the what he needed always happened to be exactly where he needed it. And I mean, so you've got examples, uh, the, the most egregious being this guy down in Australia, which I, I, I would love to hear more of the how they caught him. Um, <laughs> but for the most part, you don't run. You run into, like Russ said, guys that people just generally don't want to play for whatever reason. And so I think that says a lot about the gamers in general and gaming communities is that you've got this the the the, the this um this bugbear that everybody's worried about like what are, what are we going to do when that guy comes around and there the, that guy is so vanishingly rare that it's more a question of that kind of thing generally in my opinion sort of takes care of itself like russ said the 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 group maybe we don't need a rule on how to kick somebody out but we also don't need a rule that you have to force people to play somebody else and then that'll take you know it kind of equals out i guess right yeah over the years i've i've really been careful with the way i've kind of positioned myself in our community as to sort of not appear to take sides with uh, any um, particular club or group or anything like that. I mean, I, I think of West Gamer in particular very much as like Switzerland, you know, where it's almost like a, a neutral ground where it doesn't matter where you're from or, or uh, who you are. You know, we, we don't take sides. We, we look at every sort of situation on its merits because there are disagreements from time to time. Mm-hmm. But um, I think it's actually worked really well to the extent that I often get contacted by people out of the blue um, because I'm, I'm usually fairly, uh, you know, free and open with my, my contact details who actually get in touch with me to ask for advice on how to deal with people in similar sorts of social situations in gaming groups and say, you know, do you know this guy? Is this what he's normally like? You know, what's the best way do you think to deal with him? What would you suggest? And I, I always try and help out as much as possible because, you know, there's two sides to every story and sometimes people are just being misinterpreted. And I, and I really always like to give them the benefit of the doubt unless they've done something really serious that you know, I, I guess couldn't be read any other way. But everybody deserves a second chance. I mean, particularly yeah. when we're talking about gaming groups where you might actually come into some of these groups quite young and immature and over the course of your involvement with them, you actually have to learn some of that social etiquette that, you know, comes naturally to a lot of us who have been out there for a while. But, um, you know, if, you, if you're a new player and you're particularly if you're competitive and like to, to win, you may make some of the mistakes early on that if you're not careful can actually taint people's, uh, you know, opinion of you for a long time. So, mm. You know, people like that are still deserving of your, your help and support, particularly if they're not self-aware. I think that they really need to be right. given the opportunity to fix their behavior yeah. first before they get shunned. Well, that's what happened with one of the guys with us. Was he just didn't really understand that he was doing that. I mean, you know, it was sort of like one of those things. And, and we're all, you know, we're all geeks. We all have our little idiosyncrasies. And sometimes one of those is they don't really, you don't really read the, the, the human nonverbal feedback that you're, you know, you're frustrating your opponent by what you're doing, you know, kind of thing. Um, Definitely. So I, that, that's great advice. And I think it comes back to these all these rules, whether it's rules on how you, as Craig said, eject someone or whatever. I think less is more, really, in this situation. You want to kind of keep your club rules. We kept our club rules down to, like, one sheet of paper about how the the arbiters were ran. And that was it. Right. Um, and, and we really wanted to keep it very simple. Politicians. What's that? I just said leave the politics for the politicians. Exactly right. Yeah, it's yeah, short yeah. and sweet, and that's, that's really it. I mean, I know tournament rules are going to get longer, and that's where you have all the specifics for that particular event, but that's one event. That's not the way your group interacts, right? If your group rules are getting to be two or three or four pages, maybe maybe you want to pull back a little bit and think about just keeping it simple um, because maybe it's getting a little deep for everyone. <laughs> that's it. And so, no, hey, there was something else yeah. I, I thought um, would, would be fun to, to touch on with regards to the whole community building thing, uh, yeah. sort of move topic along. 
What, what do you guys think in terms of uh, you know, actually building that, that consistent and, and sustainable activity? So it's not just about having a group of people that meet and, and how they actually you know, interact with each other. It's a, about giving that sort of ongoing reason for them to keep doing that. So, I mean, you, you traveled around to a bunch of conventions in, in the US and some of which, which we really wish that we had over here. Um, but aside from sort of like maybe your ongoing tournament circuits and, uh, and conventions throughout the year, how do, how do you actually like to sustain that activity? What have you seen in the past? How do you stay motivated as a gamer, you mean, kind of thing? Uh, it's about giving the group something to do. Yeah. So. Well, I don't know. I, for, I think it's, um, it's interesting. With our local group, what's happened is um, we are, we've gone very magpie <laughs> sort of a thing. So, <laughs> so right now what we do is um, it's more about someone – Anyone, and this goes back to no one's really in charge, right? So someone or anyone else will just get a really exciting thing. Like like Craig will get some huge opportunity for, for Uncharted Seas and wants to run something. Yeah. Or or I get all enamored with um, you know, with Battle Or a year ago. I'm like, I want to run a Battle Or, you know, four week campaign. Who wants to play? Or or, you know, I wanna you know, Will will want to teach and demo uh, Infinity, right? So we get out one or two people get excited about it and they'll run a very short event. But it's just enough to get everybody excited and going for it. And then they get into it. They do it. It's, you know, maybe three or four weeks and you're out. So you keep it short. Right now we have a Malifaux League going on. And it got me back into Malifaux. I haven't played Malifaux in like, I don't know, five months. And I just had two games. had a great time with it. And now I'm all jazzed. I got a new model. First Malifaux model I bought in like over a year. All excited. I've got them all assembled and everything. So like that'll get you back jazzed back into the game, getting excited. Maybe playing with a different element of your larger group you haven't played with in a while. So it's great to, you know, interact with some of those friends. Get you back into it. And then then someone else will bring a new thing over and you switch over. And sort of to kind of dovetail into your cons idea, it's sort of the same thing because what I do at these different cons are different depending on the con, right? Like, so when we went to Adepticon, right, Craig? Yeah. Adepticon's totally miniature wargaming. Oh, so yeah. So we go to Adepticon, we're in miniature wargaming mode the whole weekend, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh, it was awesome. And, and, and that's something we, and then, then next time you go to Gen Con, there's miniature wargaming at Gen Con and plenty of it. Um, but it's more of an RPG and board gaming con. So in that context, we're more about what's the new hotness for here and there and what kind of, you know, new games can we play and, and, and how can we meet some listeners and people that we, you know, we know from far away uh, in that respect. So it's kind of gets you. So I guess we do different cons throughout the year to keep us excited about the different aspects of the hobby we love. Right. We've, we've almost taken the, uh, the whole structured approach to activity over the course of a year to a, a new level um, recently <laughs> with a lot of our clubs and, and tournament organizers actually working together. So we, we have a, a calendar that's set out you know, a long time in advance and, and a lot of the organizers actually try and not uh, step on each other's toes with when they organize events of a similar nature so that they can actually guarantee the best you know, turnout to their event but so that it actually forms a, a good structure for the year. Um, and something that's evolved a lot over time, which I think is really great for a community, is actually having like your, your layered tiers of events um, mm-hmm. for progressively feeding gamers through different stages of their development in the hobby. Right. So you, you get a lot of this at a store level as well, particularly with Games Workshop because they're so good at their recruitment model where they actually run their very small level introductory games and their games nights, which are designed for small points limits. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you might get people progressing on from there to you know doing your, your home gaming and your club gaming thing where maybe the games are a bit bigger, the level of experience with all the players present is a bit more advanced. And then you move on to your campaigns and, and tournaments. And I, I think that actually providing a structure that's visible is great for getting people involved because they can almost see it as like the holy grail that they can sort of work towards and, and attain if they really apply themselves. Um, it's kind of like the golden demon in that respect. I mean, who hasn't been motivated to, to paint their models um, you know, better by knowing that there's actually a, you know, an, a national st- sort of standard painting competition right. that they can aspire to one day? Yeah. Or the pictures of the models in White Wolf magazine or, or you know, uh, No Quarter or any of those other contests. I mean, there's lots of other uh, sort of high-level events that happen these days. Um, particularly from a tournament aspect, now we've actually got events on an interstate or international level where, you know, communities can actually come together and develop their player base to actually have a seat at the table of those international um, contests. So we're really fortunate now. I, I kind of see one of the, the final stages in our community building. Um, I mean, it won't be final realistically, but pro- probably the, the later um, part of our evolution is not just having that um, consistent sort of uh, and sustainable model of activity in, in Western Australia, but it's about actually expanding out to the rest of the world and establishing ourselves on almost the global stage. So um, Worlds in Radio has actually helped with that a lot. And part of the reason why JJ and I originally started the show is because we kind of wanted to shout from the rooftops how good the gaming scene was out over here. Yeah. But now we're getting people more and more involved in, in playing in interstate events and 
this year, we're very fortunate that we've actually got three players from Western Australia. Well, two, two and one who's just moved over to East Coast technically, but I'm going to call it three, <laughs> who, who are actually now playing on the Australian 40K team at the European Team Championship. Oh, and that's cool. huge. Like, that's, that's something huge. that we would never have been able to achieve before. But, but, well, that's you know, fantastic. Partly because of how we've developed over time and, and made it known yeah, I think things are really great over here. We've, we've managed to achieve that. And that looks huge. It, it's really great. It gets people jazzed. It gets them motivated. And now we've got a new generation of gamers that are coming through the ranks who are actually motivated by the potential of being able to get onto the state or the national team. And that's something they really want to aspire to do. So they play lots of games. They get involved in their community. They practice. They attend tournaments. They do everything that really helps to create that sort of thriving base of activity and makes it you know, ongoing. It's, it's fantastic. I really love it. I think it's fantastic, Luke. And I think it's awesome that you guys have built that uh, amazing um, that ability to go from, and that you guys still promote the idea of hey, whether you're starting out or whether you're, you know, you're trying to refine your skills to be on the, you know, the international team. Um, there's a place for everybody in 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 the way you guys run things. That's fantastic, and I think that's the key is keeping the the new blood coming in while also giving things for the veteran players to get excited about. Absolutely, it's a lot easier to uh, sort of attain when you have a combined approach to. If every group was off doing their own thing and not working together, like I've seen in a lot of places in the world, then it's it's a lot harder to achieve that. You, you get to, you know, a, a new level of people actually communicate more across groups and you know work together to actually achieve this. It, we're playing games; it's for everybody's benefit. There's no reason to to be snobbish about it. Right. You, you'll achieve more if everybody you know combines arms. Exactly. Mm. Well, Luke, thank you so much for joining us here at uh, Dunkin' Donuts. The guys yeah, over there giving us a great the talk. Evil Eye, yeah, it was great to hear how you guys built all that in Australia, and I think it's always fun. Hopefully, some of our listeners will be inspired to try to get their local communities rolling and, and uh, get some games in there and get some people playing together. That's right, Absolutely. and enrich the global community. Lots of fun to be had for sure. <laughs> Thanks for purchasing a D6G Lost Chapter. Supporting the show helps it grow. Craig, why don't you give me some levels while uh, Luke is closing the door? Uh, You want some levels? I'll give you some levels. Okay, How's that's that good. for levels? No, that's coming through I great. give you levels all day long. I got levels up the wazoo over here. <laughs> nice levels. Those are great. Those are, those are good. Right. You're looking nice and, uh, nice and loud there. All right. Uh, okay. All right. Luke, you want to give me a little, uh, little noise there so I can make sure you've got good levels here? A little noise. Can I, can I do it in a non-embarrassing way? Because when someone asks me for a little noise, it's usually a case of... Yeah, no gas. No, no gas, please. <laughs> well, I can't smell it from over there, so it's fine. You want to do whatever you... It's your home, you know. Knock yourself out. <laughs> no, well, yeah, literally. I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. That's right. I'm having a gas already. <laughs> nice.